This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to the Qalam Institute podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda. Qalam is pleased to announce the Sira Intensive, a two-week program studying the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Visit sirahintensive.com for more information. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Inshallah continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As-Siratul Nabawiyya, the prophetic biography In the previous session we talked about some of the uh, major events of the second year uh, of the Prophet sallallahu residence in the city of Medina uh, some of the things we talked about previously was the turning of the Qibla, the obligation of fasting in the month of Ramadan, uh, the giving of Zakatul Fitr later on that year, uh, the sacrifice for Eid al-Adha would also be mandated. So these were some of the things that were instituted during this second year. Of course, the biggest and most major event of the second year of the Hijrah uh, of the Prophet ﷺ was none other than the Battle of Badr. And so at this point in time, in the month of Ramadan, basically about halfway through the month of Ramadan, the scholars say, um, you know, about midway point through the month of Ramadan, the 17th is when the Battle of Badr actually happened. So a few days before that. Now, I'm going to have to take us back very briefly to a couple of things that happened before. First and foremost, earlier that year, a couple of months back, what had happened was that Abu Sufyan, um, along with about 30 or 40 businessmen from Quraysh, with a, a huge number of not just goods but money, was on his way to Sham, what's referred to as Bilad sham That's a very huge region that could have been anything from Palestine, Syria, Jordan, that entire region. Nevertheless, he was headed out to that area to invest that money, to do some business, to make some money. And, you know, the, the Prophet ﷺ along with the Muslims went out in pursuit of Abu Sufyan in the caravan. And they went to the place called Dhul Ushayra. But once they reached there, what they found was that Abu Sufyan along with the rest of the caravan had already left from there. So they weren't able to get them. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ even told the Sahaba that that's okay, we'll get them on the way back. I talked about this over there, but I'll just rehash it very briefly. The question is asked a lot of times in this situation that, so basically Muslims were, ro- were raiding and were looting and robbing people. They were basically relegated to being, you know, highway robbers. Um, and they were just, you know, um, you know, robbing these caravans. Is that what was going on? And in fact, a lot of times, uh, some Islamophobic rhetoric that you'll come across online says things like this. Even uh, Christian writers who wrote about Islam in the 17 and 1800s in Europe, these are some of the thoughts that they expressed as well. That's kind of the Orientalist take on the seerah, on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, is that Muhammad and the Muslims sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they go to and settle the city of Medina, and from there they basically just turn into a bunch of bandits. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from such ideas, but that's basically their understanding. So what is a Muslim response to this? So let's take a couple of things into consideration since we are talking about this now. And I've talked about this previously in one of the recordings, in one of the podcasts. So very quickly, let's take a few things into consideration. First and foremost, the muhajirun, all of these basically every single time the Muslims had gone out to pursue uh, a caravan from Quraysh, they were the Muhajirun, not the Ansar. And who are the Muhajirun? The Muhajirun are Meccan people. Meccan people who were, um, many of their friends and family members and loved ones were murdered in cold blood, in broad daylight in Mecca without any remorse or regret or retribution. They were thrown out of their own homes. Their property and wealth was taken from them unlawfully, wrongfully, even based on tribal law at that time. Of course we understand Islamically, or in a civilized society, it was taken from there wrongfully. Somebody could make the argument, but that was the law of the land at that time. No, it wasn't. Hilful Fudul was enacted, and it was in place. 
And it was enforced um, for every other situation except for the Muslims. The wealth and the money and the property and even the family of Muslims was taken from them without any remorse or regret or without the slightest bit of objection from anyone. So these people fled their homes many times after years of torture and persecution. All right, They had lost loved ones along the way. They had some way somehow barely alive, empty handed, with the clothes on their back, arrived in Medina some way somehow. Many of them before they came to Medina had actually lived for almost 8-9 years as refugees in East Africa from where they came now to Medina. So they hadn't seen their homes for a decade. And now they live there in Medina. So when they hear, when they are informed, when they find out that the people that persecuted us, the people that committed all these crimes against us are passing through here with money which very likely we have a right to. I mean that guy specifically, they could name the people. Umayyah bin Khalaf, Uqba bin Abi Mu'eed, Right? Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah. They could name these people. That if that guy's coming through here, that guy took all my money. That guy killed my brother and my wife and my child. Right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's very easy to ignore all of these details and look at the end product and say, oh, they're a bunch of bandits. But no, they had every right to retribution. And that's what they're seeking, number one. Number two, Another fact that is ignored here is that the Quraysh had not given up the cause of eradicating you know, Islam and Muslims and eventually finishing off the Prophet ﷺ. They had not given up this cause. There was still rhetoric, there was still a movement that was very much alive in Mecca that was focused towards the singular goal of raising an army, all right, Mecca was kind of the big metropolitan city. It necessarily ha- didn't have an army in place. So we need to raise up an army. We need to supply this army. And once we have a huge army in place and they are fully armed to the teeth and supplied, then all we got to do is march on Medina and finish this once and for all. Because they just could not let it go. That Muhammad left Mecca alive, safe and sound. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So... All of the, these, these details need to be observed. So when the Prophet ﷺ and the Muhajirun and the Muslims pursue Quraysh in a caravan belonging to Quraysh, number one, they are reclaiming what's rightfully theirs. Number two, they also understand that when Abu Sufyan is going to Sham with funds, those are not just in people's personal investments. That is a war fund that he is taking to invest and you know, double or triple. And when he comes back from there with goods, then again, these, they have a right to them. And number two, again, he's bringing back goods to basically supply the war fund and supply the army. So all these details are extremely relevant. Oh, and the third detail that I forgot, I knew there was a third thing I'd mentioned. The third thing was that the Muslims had not instigated this situation. But actually, the Prophet ﷺ found multiple instances during the first year of his residence in Medina. On multiple occasions, he found spies from the Quraysh that were keeping an eye on Medina and the Muslims. And there were even some instances where they had come to Medina at night and snuck back out. So they, without a doubt, were still instigating the situation. And this was a way to show us, uh, uh, make a show of strength that we will protect our homes and we will protect our families and our people. And you will not violate us. Right? And that's exactly the context of the ayat of Surah Al-Hajj, Surah number, 20, uh, surah number 22, uh, which we talked about in that earlier discussion, which you can reference back to. So keeping all of this in mind, one incident, as I said, was when Abu Sufyan, along with all the goods, was on his way to Sham. The, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims tried to intercept them at the place of Dhul Ushayra, but they were able to escape, they got away before the Muslims could get there. So this is a follow-up to that instance. The second instance to keep in mind is Ibn al-Hadrami. Ibn al-Hadrami was the other incident that we talked about where 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when things started kind of heating up in the region, in the area between Mecca and Medina and Taif and in that area of Hijaz, things started to heat up. <clears throat> And it was almost somewhat of like what they would call a cold war or a standoff that was starting to happen between the Muslims in Medina and the Quraysh in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ had sent some of the Sahaba, some of the Muslims, to a place that was between Mecca and Ta'if to camp out there to keep an eye on who's coming and going and sort of what's going on. And that's all he placed them there for. He told them, go and just keep a watch and make sure everything is okay. A group of some of the Quraysh and the Meccans, and actually some of the some of the individuals who were the most violent against the Muslims back in the day of Mecca, were passing through there. Now, the Prophet ﷺ's instructions were very clear. Just keep a watch, do not engage. Unfortunately, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ chose to kind of take matters into his own hands, and he attacked them and assaulted them, and they fought one another, and in that situation, one of the individuals of Quraysh ibn al-Hadrami, basically he died, he was killed. And this was during the sacred months, right? Like the ayam, the months of hajj, uh, and following that. So it was during the sacred months. And of course, again, the rhetoric and the, the propaganda against Muslims was, يَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِيهِ Right? That these people, they kill people in the sacred months. Do you see what Muhammad and his people do? Wasallam, they don't respect anything. They don't care about anything. Look, they'll murder people during the sacred months. And what's very interesting is that their beef was not so much with the fact that they killed this man because they knew that if anybody, if the, if the, if the Muslims of Mecca who had fled Mecca, if they did deserve retribution against anyone, then it was this man. Because he had his hand in the killing of dozens of Muslims and persecuting of dozens of Muslims. They're, the more so the point they made was it was during the sacred months. And so nevertheless, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ was apologetic, and he reprimanded the sahaba who took this action, and they paid blood money to the family of the individual, that this was wrong what happened. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even responded, قُلْ قِتَالٌ فِيهِ كَبِيرٌ That was very wrong. They should not have done that. وَصَدُّنَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَالْمَسْلِ الْحَرَامِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَاتِلِ And of course Allah responded as only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, by saying that no, they shouldn't have committed this crime, they shouldn't have killed somebody. However, what you people have done is worse. You have violated the rights of an entire people. You have persecuted an entire generation. You have eradicated entire families. So what you've done is far, far worse. So you need, to, you need to take a look in the mirror. You need to take a long hard look in the mirror before you go around accusing somebody else trying to call them murderers and, and, and people that are causing you know, havoc and wreaking havoc on society. So this, that incident, and then the fact that the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims had tried to intercept Abu Sufyan's caravan before, keep both of those things in mind now. Now what occurs at this time? It is the month of Ramadan in the second year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ's residence in Medina, and Abu Sufyan, along with 30, 40, some narrations even say there were 50 individuals, are coming back from Sham, back to Mecca, and they have to pass through the area and the region again. And they have with them, uh, some narrations mention, up to a thousand camels. They have a thousand camels completely loaded with goods and gear and, uh, and money. And this is what I was talking about. This was partially, this was the war fund. So now they're headed back. And of course Abu Sufyan, he generally was worried because you know it wasn't just about the Muslims. It was generally, obviously there's 30, 40, maybe 50 people traveling with a thousand camels loaded with goods. I mean, you're, you're basically a moving target. For anybody that wants to raid you. So he had a few people traveling ahead, kind of keeping eye, keeping an eye on things um, that keep me informed about what, um, is there anybody that's coming after us, anybody that's talking about us, anything that's going on. So at that time, um, he basically got the news that yes, Anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qada istanfara ashabahu laka wali'irik. 
that the Prophet ﷺ has found out that you're on your way. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ did. And I'm going to come back to this in a, uh, probably in the next session. But nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ found out that they were coming. And the Prophet ﷺ started recruiting some of the Muslims that who is ready to go to intercept this caravan. And at that time, some Muslims decided to go. Some necessarily weren't very... It's not that they weren't eager to go because they didn't want to go or they weren't obedient. They, based on the three, four previous instances, there had been no war, there had been no exchange, there had been no type of confrontation. So they figured that just like as the Muslims had done three times or four times previously, it was a simply to go and make it known, we will defend our home. You will not march into our homes and bully us anymore. So they would just basically go outside of Medina and stand as the caravan or the tribes would pass by just standing there, saying very clearly, making a display that, look, we're here. You approach us and you'll have to deal with us. You can walk on by, but do not think that you can just walk into our homes and bully us any longer. We're not going to tolerate that. This is our home now. And so they, the, many of the Muslims assumed that this was going to be a similar type of situation. And so some of the Muslims started to get ready to go. And I'm, like I said, in the, in the next session, I'll talk more about sort of what transpires on the Muslim side. What is the scene in Medina? Now, basically, just the fact that the Prophet ﷺ has started to make preparations, the word has kind of gotten out through Medina, Abu Sufyan is coming with his caravan, and the Prophet ﷺ is basically encouraging people to go. Abu Sufyan's spies or scouts that he has sent ahead bring him back the news that <clears throat> Muhammad ﷺ knows that you're coming and he's getting ready for you. Abu Sufyan freaks out. So what Abu Sufyan does is he hires a person by the name of Dumdum bin Amra bin Amr al Ghifari. So he hires this man and he sends him to Mecca to go and to warn the people of Mecca that Muhammad is coming, he's going to take it all everything, he's gonna attack us, and if you want to protect your people, and if you want to protect your goods and your money, you're gonna to have to come join us as soon as possible. Yes, we were building a war fund and we were preparing an army, but we'll make preparations later, right now, whatever we got, whoever we got, Get ready to go. And I also want to bring the attention to the simple fact, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit of detail. But literally, when the message reached Mecca, within a day, they had a thousand people marching out of Mecca. That does not happen overnight. That is also very, very... It's so obvious that the, these preparations were ongoing. An army was being assembled. A thousand people were ready to march with a day's notice. There were 600 um, camels that were ready to go. There were, I believe, um, 600 of the thousand men were completely armored. Um, there were, th to the extent, if I remember correctly, I'll come across this uh, in a little bit, but I believe that there were about 300 uh, horses. So the cavalry was 300 large. I mean, that is, that is a huge, very, very well-prepared army. That does not happen overnight, with the day's notice. So all of this is very indicative and representative of the fact that these preparations were long underway from before. This was already going on from before. So now that this is the case and this is a situation, so... Abu Sufyan basically sends this man to Mecca that you need to go and you need to inform them that we need them immediately. They need to come and defend us and help us as soon as possible. Meanwhile in Mecca, so now this man starts riding from overnight towards the direction of Mecca. And riding non-stop, a single person just riding like there's no tomorrow, can get there in about three days time. Three to four days time. In the meantime, in Mecca, there's an incident that occurs. The aunt of the Prophet ﷺ, the aunt of the Prophet ﷺ, whose name is Atika, Atika bint Abdul Muttalib. She is the aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. She is his father's older sister. She sees a dream. 
And in her dream, what she sees is um, that she sees a dream that frightens her. And so after waking up and seeing this dream, and some narrations say that she saw this dream three nights in a row. Bithalathi layalin. Right? Three nights in a row she saw the same exact dream. So finally after seeing the dream for three nights in a row, she's frightened. She goes to her brother, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet She goes to him and she tells him that, Brother, I've seen a dream and it's, it scares me. It frightens me what I've seen. He tells her, he says, what, what happened? She first and foremost swears him to secrecy, don't tell anybody. He says, okay, I won't tell anybody. Tell me what you saw. So she says that I saw that a man came riding into Mecca, and he was riding on the back of a camel, and he came and he stood at the place called Ibtah, which was a place outside of the Haram. He came there and he stood on the back of his camel, and he screamed out, and he said, um, <clears throat> Which basically means, let's go, let's go. Get ready, we have to march. Basically, get ready to go fight. Ya ala hudar. Ya ala hudar was an expression in the Arabic language, in classical Arabic they would use. When you wanted to shame somebody, you would use this word. Ya ala hudar. Meaning, what are you doing sitting around at home? It's time to fight, it's time to go. لَمَصَارِعُكُمْ فِي ثَلَاثٍ Death will arrive at your doorstep in three days. Death will come to your doorstep in three days. Then um, she says, فَأَرَى النَّاسَ إِجْتَمَعُوا إِلَيْهِ And I see the people gather around him. So then the man enters into the masjid, the haram. And he goes there and he stands right by the Kaaba again on the back of his camel. And again he makes the same announcement. Let's go people, let's go. Um, what are you doing sitting at home? Death will arrive at your doorstep in three days. And then it says that he then goes to the place of Abu Qubais, which is again outside of the haram. And he goes and again he stands on the back of his camel and he makes that same announcement. Then Jabal Abu Qubais, which was a mountain, which was kind of a small mountain outside of the haram, he climbs up on top of the mountain, he picks up a big old rock like a boulder, and he throws it down from the mountain into the middle of the city of Mecca. She sees this in her dream. When that big boulder crashes and hits the ground in the city of Mecca, it shatters into hundreds of pieces, and a piece of that boulder goes into each and every single home of Mecca. It goes into every single home of Mecca. She sees this dream, and she wakes up, and she's terrified. That this is obviously something very, very bad. And basically the way that she understood and interpreted the dream was, of course he's warning that death will come in three days. Then when he throws that boulder, that means that is representative of a huge calamity. And when that huge calamity will come, it will go into each and every single home in Mecca. Every single family in Mecca will be afflicted and affected by this calamity, by this tragedy that will befall the people of Mecca. So she sees this dream three nights in a row, frightened, um, completely tells her brother Abbas uh, عنه, of course he would become Muslim later on he's not Muslim at this time and she swears him to secrecy now Abbas and he advises her similarly he says don't tell anybody when Abbas عنه, now he's shaken up by this right he's thinking about this he's shaken up by it. he's overwhelmed you can see from his face like he's seen a ghost he leaves, his, he leaves there from his sister's home and he meets Walid bin Utbah who was one of the leaders of the Quraysh, but was also a very close personal childhood friend of Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. He meets him and he knows something's off and he says, what's wrong? I know something wrong. He said, don't worry about it. He really pressed him, like, come on, I'm your friend. You can tell me what's going on. You look, you look, you look um, completely terrified, right? Like you've seen something horrific. What's happened? So he says, okay, listen, you can't tell anybody, but this is basically what's happened. My sister seen this dream, and I'm really worried what this means. He ends up telling another friend of his, and before you know it, the word starts to spread. All right? So, or, or rather, excuse me, Walid bin Utbah tells his father Utbah, 
Of course, he tells his father, right? Because now he's frightened by this and his dad's like, is everything okay? What's going on with you? He tells his father. Now his father, Utbah, was one of the key anti-Muslim, anti-Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa people in, in Mecca. So he runs to his best pal, Abu Jahl, and he tells him before you know everyone, Abu Jahl knows everybody knows. Right? So now everybody knows exactly about this situation. Uh, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, فَغَدَوْتُ لِأَطُوفَ بِالْبَيْتِ I go the next day to the Kaaba because I want to go do tawaf of the Kaaba. When I walk in, Abu Jahl is sitting there among some of the leaders of the Quraysh and they're talking actually about my sister's dream. But they get quiet when Abu Jahl sees me. He gets quiet and he goes, Ya Abu Al-Fadl. That was a kunni of Abbas radiallahu anhu, Abu Al-Fadl. He says, Ya Abu Al-Fadl, إِذَا فَرَغْتَ مِن تَوَافِكَ فَقْبِلْ إِلَيْنَا When you're done with your tawaf, then please come see us. I'd like to talk to you about something. He says, okay, that's innocent enough. So he says, I finish my tawaf and I go and I sit down by Abu Jahl and all of his cronies that are around him. And he says, Abu Jahl says, Ya Bani Abd Al-Muttalib. All children of Abdul Muttalib. Now keep in mind who is Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, if again you remember from the seerah, and I've talked about this in the, some of the earlier podcasts that we had, Abdul Muttalib, because of many, many incidents, particularly the attack of Abraha and the army of the elephants, Abdul Muttalib had basically been recognized as a unified leader of Arabia. And he was one of the legend, most legendary people in the history of Makkah and Quraysh. And he was somebody that they were very proud of. And in fact, that's what gave people like Abbas and Abu Talib, uh, Abbas radiallahu anhu, Hamza radiallahu anhu, and even people like Abu Talib, this is what gave them quite a bit of license and gave them a lot of respect that they were the children of Abu. They were, some of these people were remarkable on their own, but they were the sons, they were the children of Abdul Muttalib. And even the Prophet to an extent, at least in the early part of the Prophet ﷺ, Prophet Prophet's mission, the reason why they would not lay hands on the Prophet ﷺ is, but he's the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. How can we defile, how can we violate our own history, one of our greatest heroes, and his legacies in that way? So, he says, Ya Bani Abdul Muttalib, O children of Abdul Muttalib, Mata hadathat fikum hadihin nabiya. When was this female prophet, when did this female prophet come up amongst you? Abbas says, Qala qultu, wa ma dhaka, what are you talking about? Now what are you talking about? Not just what are you talking about, what are you talking about this time? Right, because this is Abu Jahl, wa ma dhaka, qala tilka ru'ya lati ra'ata atika. I'm talking about the dream your sister saw. Qala qultu wa ma ra'at, what did she see? See, Abbas is smarter than Abu Jahl. So he won't just kind of be like, oh, let me explain that. He's like, well, what did she see? What exactly does this guy know? So he's trying to feel him out first. So he says, what did she see? He says, Ya Bani Abdul Muttalib. Of course, Abu Jahl doesn't know a lot of the details, nor is he concerned with the details. He just wants to mock, you know, the family of the Prophet So he says, Ya Bani Abdul Muttalib. Wasn't it enough that your men were becoming prophets? Not that your women are also becoming prophets, right? Female prophets. قَدْ زَعَمَتْ عَاتِكَ فِي رُؤْيَاهَا أَنَّهُ قَالْ And then he goes on to say that she says, you know, this will happen and that will happen and that will happen and this will happen. Um, and then, you know, it, it mentioned death will arrive in three days. So Abu Jahl says, فَسَيَكُونُ um, So he says, فَإِنْ يَكُوا حَقًّا مَا تَقُولُ he says, فَسَتَنَرَبْ بَصُوا بِكُمْ هَذِهِ الثَّلَاثِ I'll wait for three days. I'll wait for three days. وَإِنْ يَكُوا حَقًا مَا تَقُولَ And if what she says actually happens, فَسَيَكُونَ And it comes through. It comes true. وَإِنْ تَمْضِي الثَّلَاثِ No, he says, so I'll wait for you for three days. And if she said what will happen, it'll happen maybe. فَسَيَكُونَ If it happens, then it happens. What are you going to do? But he says, وَإِن تَمْضِي الثَّلَاثِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ ذَلِكَ شَيْءٌ But if I wait for three days, and what she says does not come to fruition, then he says, نَكْتُبَ عَلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا I will write an ordinance. I will issue an ordinance, a decree, for the people of Makkah, for Quraysh. It will say, أَنَّكُمْ أَكْذَبُ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ فِي الْعَرَبِ that y'all are the biggest liars in Arabia. Alright? Can we agree to that? 
Okay? So if what your sister says will happen in three days, we'll wait. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, I will write an ordinance, I will issue an ordinance that you, the, the children of Abdul Muttalib, are the biggest liars in Arabia, and I will hang this from the Kaaba. And y'all will be humiliated from here on forth. Alright? You have no credibility left in the community. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا كَانَ مِنِّي إِلَيْهِ كَبِيرُ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَنِّي جَحَدْتُ ذَلِكَ وَأَنْكَرْتُ أَنْ تَكُونَ رَأَتْ شَيْءً he says that I was so beside myself, but I refused to engage him. Abu Jahl was one of those people that you just don't engage with, because he had no limits, he had no boundaries. So he said that I wanted to teach him a lesson, but I refused to, and I just wished this whole situation could have been avoided. Like I wish Atika never would have seen anything to begin with. He says, I left, we went our both we both went our own ways. I went home upset. He said by evening time, every single, particularly woman from Abdul Muttalib, Bani Abdul Muttalib, like from my family, all my sisters and my aunts and everybody came to visit me at my home and to give me a piece of their mind. To reprimand me. أَقْرَرْتُمْ لِهَذَا الْفَاسِقِ الْخَبِيثِ أَنْ يَقْعَ فِي رِجَالِكُمْ That you people, he said my sisters came to me, that you people, talking about the men, saying that you people, first of all, you allowed this foul-mouthed animal to say whatever he wanted to say about our men, talking about the Prophet ﷺ, talking about Abu Talib and others. First, and Hamza radiallahu anhu, and so on and so forth. First you let him say whatever you wanted to say about our men. But now, ثُمَّ قَدْ تَنَاوَلَ النِّسَاءُ وَأَنْتَ تَسْمَعَ Now he talks about your women. He talks about your sisters, your mothers, your wives, your daughters. And you just sat there and listened to him? Say whatever you wanted to say? ثُمَّ لَمْ يَكُنْ عِنْدَكَ غِيَرٌ لِشَيْءٍ مِمَّا سَمِعَتْ you didn't have enough decency or enough dignity and honor to not let him run his mouth, to shut him up. He says that, قَدْ وَاللَّهِ فَعَلْتُ He says that, I wanted to, but I refused and I resisted. But then he swore, he says, وَأَيْمُ اللَّهِ That I swear to God, I will deal with him, don't worry. And if he does it again, I will defend your honor. I'll teach him a lesson. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, real quickly, let me kind of paint out the situation for you, paint a picture for you. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a humongous man. Alright, he was very, very tall. There are some uh, books of, the, of history and seer that actually mention that if, there was, if Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu sat on the back of kind of like a normal or even smaller sized horse, his feet used to touch the ground. <laughs> you could see him walking towards you from like a mile away. Right? He was like, like, a, like a pillar. He would just stick out. His voice was, first of all, he was a pie, right? And then on top of that, he had such a booming voice, he was like a microphone, he was a megaphone. So actually the Prophet ﷺ would have him make announcements. He would make announcements in the battlefield. He would make announcements like at the time when the Prophet ﷺ performed Hajjatul Wida, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala was the one making announcements. Like people could hear him for hundreds of yards away. Just a humongous man. So you, you know when you kind of think about what it takes for a person to sit on the back of like even a smaller horse and his feet to be on the ground. When you visualize that, I think it's safe to assume Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu was like seven feet tall. Like he was freakishly tall. He was humongous. That's Abbas radiallahu anhu. Alright, keep that in mind. Abu Jahal, the interesting thing about Abu Jahal is that he was actually not very tall, he was kind of short. And he was very frail, he was very thin. He was not a big man at all. Which actually makes you wonder, why was he so intimidating? And Abbas radiallahu anhu describes him in this particular narration, وَكَانَ رَجُلًا خَفِيفًا He says he was a light little man. He says he was a small little man. وَكَانَ رَجُلًا خَفِيفًا 
Hadid al Waj, but his face was like a blade. Like he just had this look on his face like he would cut you. Alright? Hadid al uh, Hadid al Lisan, his tongue was sharper than a blade. That's why people didn't mess with him. Because he had no shame. He would say the most vile things. Hadid al Nadr. And he just had this look. He would always look at you like he just wanted to murder you. He was just full of hate. He was an angry little man. Right? So that was who Abu Jahl was. Now, now keep in mind, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, when he's saying, I wanted to teach him a lesson, basically he's saying, I wanted to pick him up, fold him and put him in my pocket. Right? That's what I wanted to do with him. I just wanted to snap him in two. That's what I wanted to do. So he said, now I'm going to deal with him. Right after I got a, I got reprimanded by my own sisters. Like I was going to teach this man a lesson if he said anything ever again to me. So he says, I waited for three days. Right, because Abu Jahl had said, "Fasatanarabbasu bikum thalathan." I'll wait three days. All right. So he says, "Fagadatu fil yom thalithi min ru'ya atika." Three days after the dream of my sister, I went back. Um, to the Haram, to the Kaaba. وَأَنَا حَدِيدٌ مُغْضَبٌ I was mad, I was angry. I was gonna rip his head off if he said anything. I was gonna teach him a lesson. So I was angry. And he says that, um, I, I, I was hoping that he would not start anything with me. Because I didn't have to want to cause a scene. Abbas ta'ala was a very dignified man. He was a man of great dignity, a great, on, a great honor. Right, so he's like, I didn't want to. So I went into the masjid, and I was already looking, I was scanning. Before I even entered the masjid, I was already scanning the situation. And I saw him sitting there. So I started walking towards him. And he said, and at some, when I saw him, and I started walking towards him, I started to kind of think, لِيَعُودَ لِبَعْدِ مَا قَالَ فَأَقَعَبِهِ I kind of now wanted him to say something. So I could teach him a lesson. And he said that I was walking in his direction. He hadn't seen me yet. When he got up, and he like ran out the masjid. He got up and he ran out the haram. And I started thinking to myself, فَقُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِي مَا لَهُ what's, what's his deal? Right? That, why did he get up and just run away like that? He didn't even look at me yet. He hadn't seen me. Or maybe somebody told him something. I don't know. I got really confused. But then, I noticed that there was some commotion going on. I was so focused in on Abu Jal, I didn't notice the commotion. That there, there was a man who was standing, and on top of his camel, from outside the masjid, and we could hear him, and he was yelling and screaming. And people were running out there, to go see what was going on. And even the way that he was yelling and screaming was very indicative this was a norm, this was known, this type of a display was known that basically this is how you make an announcement about like a major tragedy that's coming. Like if an army is on its way to Mecca, this is how you make the announcement. You stand up on top of the camel, you yell and you scream. And when I went out there, I saw that in fact, that's exactly what was going on because and this is going to be a little gruesome. And I apologize if it bothers somebody because it's unfortunate to do that to any th- creation of Allah. But what they would do in this situation is to make a display, to make a show. They would stand up on their camel. They would yell and scream. They would um, rip like the shirt off. The man would rip his own shirt off. He would pull his hair out. He would rip his shirt off. And then he would basically... Uh, mutilate the animal that he was standing on. He would basically kill the animal that he was standing on. Right? And um, the, and even how it describes what they would do is really gruesome. Basically, he would like chop the, the nose of the animal off. Um, very unfortunate. But nevertheless, he said that he's doing all of this. The man is like stabbing his camel and ripping his shirt off and yelling and screaming. And he's saying, Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh, Al-Latima, Al-Latima. Al-Latima, Al-Latima is almost a way of saying like uh, parentless, fatherless, like orphans. So he's saying that orphans, like your children are about to become orphans, your children are about to become orphans. Amwalukum ma'a Abi Sufyan. All your money is with Abu Sufyan. Qad arada laha Muhammadun fi ashabihi. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam along with his companions is about to go and attack. 
ala ara an tudrikuha i don't think you're going to be able to get there in time to help your people al ghawth al ghawth al ghawth al ghawth he says go and help your people go and help your people and then abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says i forgot about abu jahal abu jahal forgot about me Everybody immediately went and started making whatever preparations they could. Remember I told you another incident that led up to this whole situation, the Battle of Badr, was not only the fact, of course, they had tried to catch Abu Sufyan and his caravan before, but it was also the fact that Ibn al-Hadrami had been killed. Now when they started talking, some people started saying, wait, wait, wait. Muhammad's not going to pick a fight. He's not going to really kill anybody. That's just not who he is. That's not what he does. But then somebody brought up, but boy, what happened to Ibn al-Hadrami? That's probably what he thought. But the Muslims killed him, didn't they? Right? That same situation I told you about. They killed him, didn't they? So you don't think they'll do it again? And that basically fed into some of their paranoia. That fed into the propaganda. And people started making preparations, um, you know, all around Mecca. And uh, they started heading, getting ready to head out. Now talking about just some of their preparations and heading out towards the Battle of Badr, Ibn Ishaq in his seerah, he actually mentions, فَكَانُوا بَيْنَ رَجُلَيْنِ Everybody was doing one of two things. إِمَّا خَارِجٍ وَإِمَّا بَعِثٍ مَكَانَهُ رَجُلًا Either everybody, all the men were getting ready to go, or they were finding somebody to send on their behalf. For instance, and he says that all the major leaders of Quraysh went, uh, but for example, Abu Lahab did not go. Instead of what Abu Lahab did was, he sent in his place, Asi bin Hisham bin al mughira He basically paid him 4,000 dirhams, $4,000 basically to go in his place. Why? Because Al-Asi, um, this man, Al-Asi bin Hisham bin Al-Mughira, he owed Abu Lahab $4,000. So Abu Lahab showed up at his house. What's going on? You have my money? He said, no. Okay, fantastic. I have a proposition. You go on my behalf. You don't even go on your behalf. You go on my behalf. You're going to wear my, my name tag. You're going to go on my behalf to this fight against Muhammad. And we'll consider ourselves equal. Right? We're good. Your, your, your debt is settled. So in this way, either people were going or they were trying to find somebody to go on their behalf. Now, speaking of all the leaders of the Quraysh going, there's a very interesting uh, little story and I'll basically conclude with this. Umayyah bin Khalaf. Umayyah bin Khalaf is one of the leaders of the Quraysh. Somebody who is a very vile opponent of the Prophet ﷺ and even of the Muslims. He was known to have persecuted many Muslims, including Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu had suffered a great deal at his hands. So Umayyah bin Khalaf did not want to go. There's a couple of different narrations about why he did not want to go. One of the narrations why he did not want to go is that, um, one of the narrations mentions that in general, he was a little bit older, he was very wealthy, and in fact it mentions that jasim and thaqilan, that he was very, very overweight. And so just naturally being lazy, right, he was like, why am I gonna go? I'm rich, I'm fat, why am I gonna go to battle, right? Makes no sense for me. So he's like, I'm not gonna go. So Uqba bin Abi Mu'id came to him, and... Um, Umayyah bin Khalaf was sitting in near the haram in the masjid. He was kind of sitting there with some of his people around him. Uqba bin Abi Mu'id comes and he had one of those, um, like, like we kind of know it as like a, a perfumer, an oud burner, right? Where you take like the wood chips uh, and you burn them and for like you kind of uh, perfume an area. He had one of those with him. So sometimes they would kind of walk around with it. It was like a lantern, they would carry it around. So he had that with him and he comes and he puts it down in front of Umayyah bin Khalaf. Now I'm directly relating his words. And he tells him, uh, Tajammar, Istajmir, excuse me. He says, Istajmir, Ya Aba Ali, Istajmir. He says, Here. Take some perfume. فَإِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مِنَ nisa. He says, you might as well, and I've specifically put perfume in here that women like because you're basically a woman. And he's like, you know, he says to him, قَبَّحَكَ اللَّهِ وَقَبَّحَ مَا جِئْتَ بِهِ He says, how dare you say something to me like this? Right? How can you talk to me like that? And he says that you're not going for battle. You're staying home with all the women folk. So I thought maybe you'd like some, uh, some women's perfume so that you're comfortable amongst all the women folk. So he insults him. Then on top of this, there's another incident. 
The other incident is that this man Umayyah bin Khalaf, he had a very, very good friend who was from the city that would eventually become Medina. It was called Yathrib before it was called Medina, Yathrib. There was a man in Yathrib by the name of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He would become a great sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ. Somebody about whom the Prophet ﷺ said that the day that he passed away, the Prophet ﷺ said so many angels came down for the janazah of Sa'ad bin Mu'ad that no place on the earth is open. The entire earth is packed for his janazah. The Prophet ﷺ said, اِهْتَزَّ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ بِمَوْتِ Sa'ad bin Mu'ad. When Sa'ad bin Mu'ad died on this earth, the throne of Allah shook. Such a beloved man to Allah and His Messenger. But before Islam, before being a Muslim, or, or rather, before be, being a Muslim, he used to come to visit for business to Mecca, and uh, Umayyah bin Khalaf used to go to Yathrib slash Medina for business. And they became very good friends, both being leaders of their tribes, and when they would visit, they would stay at the other's home. They would host them in their home. And so they became very close over time. After the Prophet ﷺ received revelation and preached his message for 13 years and then migrated to Medina and Sa'ad bin Mu'ad became a Muslim, right? Sa'ad bin Mu'ad was visiting Mecca one time. And when he was visiting Mecca, um, of course, uh, Umayyah bin Khalaf said, you gotta stay with me. Now Sa'ad bin Mu'ad was hesitant because he knew that this man hates the Prophet ﷺ and I now love the Prophet ﷺ. How can I go and I stay with him? So he was a little bit hesitant but he said, you know what? He's being decent, shown hospitality, I'll be decent and I won't refuse his hospitality. Sure, why not? So he goes and he stays in his home. The next day, he, and so Sa'ad bin Mu'ad makes a request. He goes, while you're gonna play a good host, I have a specific request. I want you to take me to the Kaaba at the time of the day when it is the lowest amount of traffic because I want to pray at the Kaaba. Because the Prophet ﷺ, I always hear him talking about praying at the Kaaba and I want to do that. So he says, sure, I'll take you. So he takes him at noon time, when most people would kind of leave because of the heat and go take a nap at home or something like that. He takes him there and lo and behold, they run into Abu Jahl. Now when Abu Jahl, they run into him, Abu Jahl immediately says, Ya Aba Safwan, to Umayyah bin Khalaf, Ya Aba Safwan, Man hadha ma'ak? Who's this with you? So he says, Hadha Sa'adun, this is Sa'ad, my buddy from Yathrib. So Abu Jahl says, Allah araka tatufi bi makata aminan. He says, I will not watch you come here and do tawaf and pray at our Kaaba peacefully. You're one of them Muslims. Qada awaitum as subat. You gave refuge to those um, you know, faithless, uh, disloyal people who left here our city. Waza'antum annakum tansurunahum wa tu'aynunahum. You want to help them in their cause. Ama wallahi lawla annaka ma abi safan ma raja'ta ila ahlika saliman. He says, I swear to God, if my buddy Umayyah bin Khalaf, one of our leaders, my colleague was not with you, you wouldn't have been able to go back home to your family. Like I would have finished you right now. Abu Jahl says this. Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, I mean, the people of Medina, generally speaking, were a lot more trained in war than the people of Mecca. Right? And Sa'ad bin Mu'adh particularly was known as a furious warrior. So Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, he says to him, Wallahi la in mana'atani hadha la amna anna kama huwa ashadu alayka mink. Tariqaka ala al Medina. He says, listen, I'm not going to threaten you like a child the way you threaten me. I just tell you this, if you don't get out of my way and I don't get to go pray at the Kaaba, you can forget about passing through anywhere in the vicinity of Medina. I will lock down all your trade routes. So you just try me. You try me. And so Umayyah bin Khalaf comes in and he's got to make sure he doesn't cross any lines. So he tells Sa'ad, لا ترفع صوتك يا سعد على أبي الحكم don't raise your voice on Abu Jahl, they would call him Abu al-Hakam. فَإِنَّهُ سَيِّدُ أَهْلِ الْوَادِي He says that, you know, he's the leader of our people. Don't raise your voice on him. Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, دَعْنَا عَنْكَ يَا أُمَيَّةِ He says, go. I don't need your hospitality. I don't need you. You go. You go with your buddy. And he says, فَوَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ سَمِعَتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى 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 ال they, that the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims will kill you specifically. Like I've heard your name. So you chew on that. You think about that. Immediately, Umayyah bin Khalaf freaks out and he goes, 
Bi Makkah? You're meaning he'll kill me in Makkah? He says, I don't know where he'll kill you. But I know that he said that he will be the end of you. And so Umayyah bin Khalaf got scared. And he swore that day, I will never leave Makkah ever again. I will never leave Makkah. Even when he goes home and he tells his wife, you won't believe what happened. Sa'ad, you know my buddy Sa'ad from Yathrib, he told me that Muhammad says that he's gonna kill me. She said, in Makkah? He said, I don't know if in Makkah or not. Then she goes, okay, then just don't never leave Makkah. Don't ever go out of Makkah. Because we don't see Muhammad coming back to Makkah anytime soon. And so Umayyah bin Khalaf had no plans to go for Badr. Abu Jahl on the day, after he got insulted at the Kaaba, at the Haram, by that other man, he goes home. And Abu Jahl is waiting for him at home. And he says, Umayyah, you have to go. You're a leader of the people. If you don't go, nobody will go. So he says, okay, I guess I gotta go. And he starts making preparations. And he tells him, don't worry, we'll make sure you're okay. And Umayyah bin Khalaf says, I'm gonna keep my horse always ready so I can run away when I need to. And I'm gonna keep my distance from you guys a little bit. He goes, that's fine, but you have to come. You have to leave home. So people see that you left home. When he gets ready to go, even his, in Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his Musnad mentions this narration that as he's leaving, his wife قَالَتْ لَهُ إِمْرَتُهُ وَاللَّهِ إِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا لَا يَكْذِبُ She tells her husband, you can go if you want to, stubborn man, you can go. But I swear to God, Muhammad does not lie. I swear to God, Muhammad does not lie. You're not coming back home. You can go if you want, but you're not going to come back home. Um, there's some more uh, details about this, but it's time for Salat al-Isha, so let's go ahead and stop here inshallah, and we'll continue talking about the Battle of Badr, and some of the events leading up to the Battle of Badr next week. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik.